Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation. Man to man. No excuses are offered. None accepted. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts. Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are sock full of that, man. Go right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Have you guys heard why uh, Alabama got rolled by Clemson in the national title game? No. It's because they didn't want to be there. They, they were expecting <laughs> to be in the wild card round playing the Cowboys <laughs> and the Seahawks. Or, they didn't want to be there. They had higher aspirations. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the SEC myth, which uh, has me a little perturbed. But uh, this show, this edition of Longhorn Blitz, the first Longhorn Blitz of 2019. Uh, gentlemen, I can't, since we've been doing this show, there's not been a better way. We've started a new year than what we're going to talk about today. A New Year's Six Bowl victory. Texas gets it done in the Sugar Bowl, 28-21 over Georgia. And as we'll talk about, it wasn't even that close, uh, as the final score indicated. So we'll talk about that beatdown uh, and look at where the Longhorns go from here. I am Jeff Howell. Let me bring in the rest of the team, and then we'll take care of some uh, kind of housekeeping, house cleaning items before we get rolling. He's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. Matt, how was your New Year's, and uh, how are you, sir? I enjoyed the New Year's, good holiday times, and then doing pretty well. we got some nice weather, but it's been pretty good basketball season, just good way to tip off and end all of football, though. Yes, Matt is your guy. Uh, hit him up at Longhorn Blitz for your uh, daily fantasy sports insights and good plays and whatnot. Matt's always uh, Feel free. on top of that. Uh, a man who's on top of daily fantasy and Fantasies of all kinds, because he is the Renaissance Man here on Longhorn Blitz and the Renaissance Man at 104.9 The Horde. Lifetime Longhorn 2002, UT All-American 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas in the 40 acres where he earned his degree. When he gets his T-ring in, he will wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts forever and ever. Mr. Rod Babers. And, Thanks for um, the intro, brother. You know, Rod, let's, uh, before we get into the nitty-gritty, let's talk about kind of the situation. That is not really a situation we've got going on here with the show. But we had planned to have a, a big, lengthy Sugar Bowl preview. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, Rod, you got tied up trying to get back from Idaho, which I sounds was, uh, like... Uh, I was sent to West Texas without my consent, <laughs> which is never so, good. And I did feel violated, by the way, hanging out in West Texas. I was in Midland. Um, Even when it's with your consent, it's sometimes it's still it's not, not good. good. I've yeah. never spent that much time in West Texas that deep in West <laughs> Texas. I mean, that's deeper in West Texas than Lubbock. It's as West Texas as it gets. That's the oil country. Yeah, and I got to tell you. You were in Midland, right? Uh, yeah. Everybody I know from Midland that deep in West Texas <laughs> were, are usually trying to get the hell out of that deep in West <laughs> Texas. Or they're in Austin somewhere. So, in short, Alaska, uh, there was some, some weather issues, and they flew us to what they thought was the most – uh, a convenient and safest airport, which was Midland, Texas, which they they don't really have a hub there. So they didn't have a way to get us out of Midland because, <laughs> number one, they ran out of fuel. That's why they landed in Midland. It's amazing. Number two, apparently there is a, I didn't know this, there's a number of hours a, a pilot can fly yeah. per yeah. 24 hours. Yeah. And the number is nine. You don't so want them falling circled, asleep on the yeah, job. Exactly. So this flight that was supposed to be four and a half hours ended up being about six and a half hours, like in the air, flying and circling. Waiting ended for up the at storm. Midland to, to refuel. And he tells us, oh, I can't fly, guys, because I don't. I'm, I met my quota right. already. And then they tell us, well, because we're in Midland, there are no pilots who live in Midland. <laughs> if you're a pilot, why the hell would you live in Midland? Damn, like, yeah. right? All the guys who have ever been pilots move the hell out of Midland. So they bring in buses <laughs> to bus us from Midland to Austin. If you ever took that bus ride, 
That's a six and a half hour bus ride. From yeah, I was Midland wondering, to Austin. and did, so y'all sort yeah. of basically were stuck in the airport, like I thought had to sleep in the airport, oh, and then dude, they ran out of water. <laughs> they ran out of water in the airport. I was just <laughs> imagining <laughs> what a Midland airport dude. night turning into a bus oh, ride to Austin dude. would turn into. It was like Lord of the Flies on that plane, though. People were going off. Oh, when they told us, like, hey, <gasps> you guys are going to sit, because honestly, the people punked the pilot into letting us off the plane. Yeah. They were going to keep us on the tarmac. And there was some dude, because there was babies and dogs. Like, and, we need out of here. Dude, it was all kind of stuff going on. But these people lost their minds. They got lowered to fly. They went and talked to the pilot. That's Only awesome. white men can do that, by the way. Yeah. I, as a black man, I was like, I'm, I'm not going Going to the it cockpit? It like three white guys <laughs> who was like, you know what? I'm getting tired of this BS, man. I'm going to go talk to the pilot. And I was like, that's a good idea. And I was like, I'm not I'm not going to that yeah. group. And it was three you guys right that ahead. went and talked to the pilot. And they got an audience with the pilot. And then the pilot came on the, uh, the speaker like five minutes later and was like, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys, you know, we're going to try to get you guys to the airport. The Midland Airport is closed. It was like 3 in the morning. It's closed. Airport's closed, by the way. We didn't know that either. That airport's closed, but apparently they do. Uh, I always watch the terminal. So if I you're in Midland, closed, <laughs> if you're we in are used to. So then they bust the buses in. It takes them three hours to get the buses there. Bus is coming like 6 in the morning. Uh, then there's a six-hour bus ride all the way back to Austin. That's why I missed the beginning of the show. Also, why I couldn't record the podcast. And my man Matt saved our butt because we didn't have a dog sitter at that point because we mm-hmm. thought we were going to be home. And Matt went and took care of the dog. So, in short, that was my uh, planes, trains, and automobiles nightmare. So, on top of Ron. So, you didn't even make it to your own show in time? I didn't even make it to my You were trying. I remember you thought you could. On top of Rod's travel issues, uh, I was in New Orleans for all of a day and got laryngitis. I woke up Saturday morning (laughs) in my hotel (laughs) with no voice. Um, I did the pregame show for the Horn with... uh, Trey and BK and Aaron and I had no voice. I really had to. I, I kind of self medicated with cough drops and chloroseptic and hot tea. And as you guys can wow. tell, I'm still not still. fully recovered from that. On top of that, this morning I woke up feeling flu like. So I'm no. like I'm like Alabama last night. I'm just getting my ass kicked from multiple fronts. <laughs> 2019 is whipping you already. Yeah. Boom, you've been boom, running boom, on boom, fumes boom, since yeah. basically uh, New Year's Day. Yeah. So, 2019 is not. Uh, and then I had yeah. I had to stay the night in Beaumont on my way driving back from New Orleans because the weather was just garbage uh, in Southeast Texas and Louisiana. Oh, yeah. So well, Beaumont's yeah. better than Midland. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree with that. See, it, it, it's negligible. It's like, yeah, yeah it's, it's close. Yeah. One's an oil one town. Has a buff, one has one's a buffalo a, wild wings, I think. <laughs> yeah, but one of them's an oil town on the Gulf that stinks. One's the biggest oil town hey, in if, the if you're, of Texas. If you're, if you're a big enough city that I can find a Marriott property so I can get me some points during an emergency stay. It's good. That's true. I think, mean, yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm and not going to insult the, Midland people anymore. I missed, uh, I missed morning rush hour in Houston, so that was another. That's a blessing right that there. That was another big uh, positive yeah, on the road. Rage. But let's go ahead and talk about it, guys. Uh, 28-21, Texas beats Georgia. Uh, we talked about ways Texas could win the game. We said, hey, they've got to do this, this, and this on both sides of the ball, and this, this, and this have to happen. N- I don't think there's anybody that predicted or thought or imagined that it would go down the way it did, which Rod basically threw the better part of three quarters. Texas was the more physically dominant football team. They took it to Georgia from the jump, and it seemed like Georgia just kind of took pretty much the whole first half kind of staggering. And then late in the first half, early in the second half, when it looked like Georgia might actually have a chance to get back in the game, uh, we see Ryan Bushevsky pull out. I-, I thought that was the key sequence in the game for me when it looked like Georgia could have gotten a score before the half. Bushevsky punting out of his own end zone gets a roller on, on a 52-yard punt to get you to the half. And then you come out, the defense comes out the first possession of the second half, gets an interception to get the ball right back for the offense. Oh, that's essentially yeah. when Georgia could have got back in the game and Texas slammed the door. It, it was just a complete beatdown, like I said, for the better part of three quarters. Score does not indicate. If you watch that game and you understand Texas controlled that game yep. for the majority of it, it was only in desperation mode where you saw Georgia get back in the game. They just never recovered from the initial shock. You know, people are going to throw out, you know, Georgia wasn't, uh, you know, they weren't excited about that game. They wanted to play the national title game. I understand that. That's uh, just some human nature in that. But uh, Kirby Smart is the closest source, or at least the, uh, I would say, the most important source on this topic. And he says, my guys were excited to play Texas. My guys were into I mean, who's not excited to play Texas, by the way? Don't we always say that when anybody plays Texas, even if it's Kansas or K-State or whoever it is, I always say you get their best shot because it's Texas and everybody wants to not only beat that brand, they want to embarrass that brand. 
Everybody, oh, yeah. nationally, everybody plays Texas. They especially get excited. Especially the SEC. Especially the SEC. So I, I don't, I don't think that's true. It's a Sugar Bowl. The SEC. I think they were excited to play. But Kirby Smart said we got out physical. We got out coached. We got out played. He said Texas just beat us. And the thing that I think, if we're all surprised, and I agree, I think ninety eight. Point nine percent of all of us mm-hmm. are surprised the way Texas won that game. Yeah. Georgia is also in that ninety eight point nine percent. Yes, I think Georgia because what we watched on that that game, what we watched uh, in the Sugar Bowl, guys, that's not what we've seen on film from Texas all year long. We just said that Oklahoma beat Texas in the trenches in the Big Twelve title game, and yet on both sides of the ball, they come out against Georgia, who most people believe is the third best team in the country and probably the second or third most physical team in the country. And Texas is able to not only win the line of scrimmage but dominate the line of scrimmage. My biggest takeaway, Jeff, you had a great tweet during the game that I thought pretty much summed up the game, in my opinion. Um, the defensive line, the depth of the defensive line overwhelmed the Georgia offensive line. And I've, I haven't seen Todd Orlando in his two years here play that many defensive linemen. I was like, what the? Keandre Colbert and, you know, I mean, they had and so Moro Ojimo on a bad wheel played Moro. probably five, six snaps. I mean, and, and not just putting them in in kind of, Trash reps, and that's trash reps, but irrelevant reps. These guys were playing, I'm mm-hmm. talking about in crucial downs and distances. He was switching up the D line. So I think to me, that my biggest takeaway is that Texas defensive line depth, which I have not seen mm-hmm. the entire year that deep, went up against Georgia and pretty much overwhelmed them and suffocated them. Yeah, because you could tell they. Uh, the first quarter, it was the first game that I remember that it reminded me of when I went to a 2013 Texas OU game, and there really hadn't been one like that where you sort of come into it, you don't know about the physicality and the nature of this team. You may be a little skeptical that you're going up against somebody better than you, and Texas came out from the very beginning and began to win the line of scrimmage. But in, from the first snap, if you knew nothing about the seasons up to that point, you're like, oh, Texas, they're the most physical, they're powerful, they're the speed team here, and there were, and if you look at like the numbers afterwards, it blew me away seeing like Georgia's line yards per carry 1.76 and it's like the best offensive line in the country and they had by far their worst production and I think it was strictly because of Texas when you look at some holding Swift to just like 12 yards on eight carries but you see how that happens in his he only averaged one and a half a carry and it's sort of when you combine that power and speed like you couldn't Swift couldn't get to the outside all they had to do was possibly run with Holyfield and that was the only thing that was semi-successful early on and Texas's just line of scrimmage was able to use it was just amazing to see the power and speed combination where Texas looked to be on the level of Georgia, and they were out executing Well, that that was was Todd Orlando. Yeah. That's when Todd Orlando comes into the fold. Now, the depth on that defensive line, uh, I think those guys were fantastic. practices helped a ton. But Todd Orlando's game plan was masterful. It was, man. It was an architect. That's probably the best overall game plan and game that he's called since he's been at Texas. You got to go back and look at it in terms of how he matches. He he plays – I mean, we see him in the 3-4 – uh, we see the 50 defense. We see him playing the nickel. We see the three, dime. Three, they played some 3-3 three, three stack in that game. Dude, they played three, he, I almost, he was as multiple as you've ever seen him in that game. Yeah. And I think I would say being multiple is not only in you know playing three down fronts and four down fronts, but it's also in, in personnel you should be multiple, in formations you should be multiple. I mean, go look at some of those, those funky uh, third and longs that Georgia had to go up against those funky defensive fronts. I mean, at one point, it's I think Malcolm Rhodes plans the D tackle. I see uh, yeah, Charles over, Minhu, the, over the ball. Roach Charles, is over the ball. Yeah, he's playing D tackle over the ball, it's like zero technique basically. And you see Charles Minhu standing up in a two point stance on the outside. And then they got three or four other guys in two point stances just at the line of scrimmage in a ghost front. I mean, Jake Fromm admitted he said, I had no idea mm-hmm. how to adjust to what they were doing. I figured it out what they were doing, but it was they were so fast basically, and Texas was so powerful. That I, you know, I really couldn't. They couldn't adjust to it. And by the time they adjusted to it, and ironically enough, is when they started to look more like a Big Twelve team. Is when Georgia started to adjust to it. When they spread the ball out. When they, when they, you know, got into a spread formation. When they were up tempo. That's when Georgia actually gave Texas trouble. Ironically, not mm-hmm. shocking to yeah, us. 40, because yep. That's, that's Big the 12 style football. that yeah. you need to play so, these days. Yeah. So uh, up against that that offense, where I mean, no program in the history of college football has had four thousand yard rushers. Four different thousand yard rushers in two seasons. Georgia has over the last two years. So that that offense that, that was the best running back duo that Texas has faced probably since was well, Sabaje Piran mm-hmm. and Joe Mixon was at two what, two three years ago at Oklahoma. Yeah. So 
for and I think Texas, I think Oklahoma's had like two hundred something yards rushing against Texas that day. For for Texas to do that up against Georgia, considering that NFL talent in the backfield, NFL talent on the offensive line, I think that's the best performance we've seen from Todd Orlando. Man, it was a masterful multiple game plan. He used deception. He used depth. He used uh, you know speed. He was always the aggressor. Mm-hmm. Always. The defense was they thought were, were the ones the setting the tempo, and yeah. that's if you can have a defense be the one, be the unpredictable one, where the offense has become defensive because they don't know what's happening to them, yep. and then you can set that tempo. Rarely do you see that in, but when that happens, that team normally dominates wow. and can play out of their minds. And this is sort of the <laughs> like everything coming together for the last two years of what Texas fans wanted to see because we always preached how versatility is so big with the position uh, ability to switch over and but make yourself multiple with the same personnel and give yourself different fronts or different looks to confuse people where then if these players have these multi skills Mm -hmm. you never know what they can do and then when you add on to it like we always compared like oh man if Texas can get into that year two when you can get that first class to get into that exponential growth period and this is exactly that time period that Ohio State hit it with Herman when Ezekiel Elliott and all those guys were sophomores and you could see that growth where the hell they lost to Virginia Tech and Charlie Brewer at the beginning of that season and ended up winning a national championship because if you have your guys there which they did at that time which Texas does now and you get to the end of that sophomore year you're starting to get to that tipping point of careers the way we saw the growth of Cole McCoy going into a junior year and if you can get that growth premature Surely, where those guys by the end of their sophomore year coming in can now show that, oh, yeah, it started with Maryland and we ended here and it can be the exponential growth. So all the things Texas fans wanted from even like a power spread offense and the ability to have a quarterback that can really dictate the terms. And then you're saying how Orlando is able to do that on the other side. And basically now you're getting to the point that if you're getting the best players and then you're doing all those things and they all start to align. It's really hard to beat a team because you're Texas and you've been able to get the best players whenever you aren't even good and aren't even executing. Now you can get that exponential growth and confidence. It can all just sort of either avalanche into something big or you at least are going to be at that 10-win plateau that you always hope that Texas's baseline is. Rod, getting back to Todd Orlando's defensive game plan, and to me, when you talk about how Texas won the game, that's where it starts is what yep. they did on defense. Because you know, you can look at that Georgia defense and say, okay, and yeah, they were missing Jordan Davis, and they didn't have mm-hmm. DeAndre Walker, yeah, and they were yeah. missing DeAndre Baker. But that Georgia offense wasn't missing any pieces at all. No. They were still running full throttle. Yeah. And I think when you look over the body of work of this season, I think that's the most frustrating thing, or at least it should be, in my opinion, for Texas fans is, the Todd Orlando we saw in the Georgia game, like that's who Todd Orlando is. He Should wants be. to be multiple. Yeah. Uh, he wants to throw different looks at you. Uh, he, he wants to be aggressive. He wants to take the fight to you. And especially you know, in the Oklahoma State game and in the West Virginia game, we saw a different Todd Orlando. We saw a Todd Orlando that seemed almost more, I don't, I don't want to say passive, but uh, kind of just more reactive. Yeah. Uh, than proactive in terms yeah, of the game plan. principles, though, man. If you look at the no, percentile performances, I, this I was it. just another one to align with what we talked about all of December, where Texas's defense had, had a percentile performance at 66% to 90% against everything that is non-air raid. Then against the air raid offenses, it's been 6% Oklahoma, 18% Oklahoma State, 10% West Virginia, 11% Tech, and then it was 13 Oklahoma. Back to Georgia, 70% performance it's just something along those lines that's still having to adjust that's the final piece to the puzzle to be the one the dominant defense of college football right no, no I, I don't think there's a defense no exactly there isn't one yeah. that's no, the point exactly. I, I, I get that my, my point is you know i would if, if texas is going to lose ball games you know with the defense having breakdowns i would rather see them do it with todd orlando doing what he does best which is what we saw against georgia you know what we saw against iowa state what we really saw for three quarters of the oklahoma game where texas was clear or the first meeting the with first oklahoma meeting, yeah. where texas clearly well, was more meeting, physical like, and and yeah, yeah there were stretches still held under all of their average yeah, right there, yeah. there were stretches in that second meeting where texas was the more physical team uh, mm-hmm. but you guys get what i'm saying i mean that and you know I, I feel good about one observation i made in one of the bowl practices i was at at the superdome um, and Robbie, you've been in enough bowl practices. You know this. I mean, if you're not playing in the bowl game, you're probably at the back of the line, and maybe you're going three quarter speed on reps, and mm-hmm. you know maybe not going full throttle. But watching the defensive line work, with the exception of Moro Ojimo, who, based on how he looked moving around, I didn't think he was going to be able to play. The other nine guys, they're going through drills hard, and Oscar Giles is putting them through drills hard. I'm thinking, man. 
I think all ten, all nine of those guys, and Ojimo, if he's healthy, I think all those guys are going to play. It's crazy. And, and that's exactly how it unfolded. And like I, I went in the game thinking, I think the strength for Texas is going to be in numbers because there are certain situations where if you can put a Gerald Wilbon on the field or even a Taquan Graham, you know, Malcolm Roach, in terms of size, those guys match up size wise, even as big as Georgia is, you know, Gerald Wilbon at those three ten, Chris Nelson at three fifteen. You know, depending on how you want to play things, you you've got the ability to be able to not necessarily match personnel with Georgia, but at least get yourself a more favorable matchup yeah. with some of your D line looks. And we you know, we never saw them go and uh, it would be foolish to do this against a team like Georgia, but we never saw them kind of rush three and drop eight and catching blocks. They were going at the line of scrimmage all night. And I love, you know, right, like you said, we saw we saw times where Brecken Hager and Joseph Osai were basically playing like wide nine techniques. Mm-hmm. And you were almost in a true yep. four man front, four down front. Yep. So every I, I, passing down, I mean, who was wide? Yeah. Every passing down. I can't, I mean, I can't say enough good things about that game plan Todd Orlando put together and how they executed it because that, in essence, is who Todd Orlando is as a defensive player. Yeah, and I feel like, uh, you know, Kanye West and the 2009 VMAs. Uh, when mm-hmm. Taylor Swift gets the award, and he's like, "Hey, hey, I'm gonna let you finish, uh, but uh, you know what? Uh, you know, Beyonce had one of the greatest music videos of all time. Of all time. I, I feel like you know Sam Elling is great. He's the MVP. Uh, Tom Herman's done a great job in his second season with the second to two year turnaround. But Todd Orlando had one of the greatest, uh, you know, defensive game, game plans, plans of all time. time. I mean, of all time. Seriously, mm-hmm. it was it was that masterful. And uh, one of the examples of the mm-hmm. aggressiveness of Todd Orlando's game plan. I mean, I haven't seen that many cornerback blitzes from Todd Orlando. And I know he likes the cornerback blitz. We've talked yeah. about that. Mm-hmm. But I haven't seen that many in one game the entire year. Now, I don't know if it was an automatic check. i got to go back and see if it was kind of what, uh, what Oklahoma did against Texas in the Big 12 title game where they said, no, it was kind of an automatic check based on the offensive formation, down, distance, circumstance, that kind of thing. Uh, but, man, Chris Boyd was – was constantly coming off yep. that corner blitz. Somebody was coming almost like every series. There was every easily... defensive series. I believe there was a cornerback blitz yes. that I can count. I'll, I'll go back and make sure, but I believe at least the the first eight there were. Uh, but I think he just wanted to make sure if I'm going down, I'm going on the blaze of glory, y'all. Yep. Okay, and but he, it was just like we said, right? We said he's got to get run blitzes. He's got to blitz on first down. You got to make sure that you counter their power with speed. Mm-hmm. You suffocate them with speed. That's what they did. They brought eight guys in the box, made it obvious that they were gonna try to stop the run, but they didn't. Uh, they they didn't do it by allowing Georgia to get to the second level and to engage them. No, no, no. They brought the fight to Georgia. Georgia just couldn't catch up with their speed. And I think Georgia was shocked a little bit about how powerful Texas was. Give Yancey yep. McKnight some credit. I think they were like, damn, these well, guys can run well, and they can hit. So, And, and, and keep this in mind, uh, too. With, they did all that on defense without arguably their best defensive player, Caden Stearns. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's impressive. You, you could argue, you it's could argue, crazy. Yeah, you could argue he's their best defensive player, even though he's a true freshman. Uh, I think he was a freshman All-American uh, uh, this week he was named. But that, to me, is amazing. It reminds me of last year, right? The – the, the the Texas Bowl, you know, without without Deshaun Elliott and without Houghton Hill mm-hmm. and without Malik so Jefferson, feel good about the next and year. Exactly, we were like, man, yeah. I don't know the defense. Got, and those were, that was all, arguably that was right. their best game of the season defensively, mm-hmm. and their best game of the season period as a team. You could argue was that Texas Bowl, and I would say it again the second year that the best game of the season for Texas, specifically defensively, was you know in the Sugar Bowl against. That's Georgia. awesome because that's, that's what great, you want to be you know, going I mean, towards. That's a, yeah, it's a great trend, and also against SEC team so I think that to me that that Todd Orlando game plan I mean they should they should put that damn thing in Moncrief somewhere it's like <laughs> the Greg Davis so case versus Oklahoma that thing like, was, it, a... it was that's the reason they won yeah. he is he is the unsung MVP I know Sam Ellinger was great Bam Bam Sam we'll talk about that uh, I like Tom Herman uh, Tom Herman and 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 give uh, Tim Beck some credit to their aggressive game plan and the tweaks they made but nobody expected Todd Orlando to come up with a game plan that damn no. effective. It was amazing. And to just put the numbers on top of your uh, DB Havoc that was brought, eight of the ten credited Havoc plays were from defensive backs from Texas. Bringing them in the 80%. box. 80%. Yeah. You get ten. B.J. Get... Foster and most – Chris Boyd and B.J. Foster are a lot of yeah. them. Four of them for B.J. Foster alone, and then you had them spread out around the other four guys. And then the, just for yeah, context, Georgia ended up with uh, havoc play five Havoc plays, so Texas with ten. To get ten in a game against that offensive line, I mean, it's just so awesome to see. And then the ability to have that many guys come. I mean, you get one from Brandon yeah. Jones, one from Boyd, one from Locke, one from Davis, yeah. and four from B.J. 
B.J. Foster. Yeah, he is the master of the art of confusion, as Clay Hilton called him. Hmm. So, something that Matt brought up earlier, and I want to mention this as we kind of start to transition toward talking about the offense. One thing I talked about going into the game that I felt Texas needed to do was they needed to dominate the physicality battle, the physicality battle on the perimeter. Yeah, I thought that's Skill where positions. they had the edge. Not just like we talked about the Texas wide receivers against the Georgia defensive backs, especially the secondary minus DeAndre Baker, but the Texas defensive backs against the Georgia wide receivers. And you mentioned Chris Boyd, uh, Rod, with his ability to blitz. Matt, you brought up DeAndre Swift never mm-hmm. really got loose. That's because I thought the safeties did a great job of filling the alley all night, and there mm-hmm. were time and time again where you saw Chris Boyd or Devontae Davis or one of the safeties get off a block and go make a tackle in space on one of those big running backs and limit the game. This is what blows my mind about the rushing yardage numbers. You know, people look at 30 carries, 72 yards. If you take out the sack yardage and take out the 14 yards Georgia lost on the, the bad punt snap, they're still 24 for 99. That's crazy. That offense, you held them to under 100 yards. Yeah, it's the lowest and, total of the season. 3.6 for carry. And they never had a run from scrimmage longer than 11 yards. That's crazy. That's nuts to me. Yeah. That's what the speed of Texas. I mean, that's yeah. the speed. Yeah, they because usually that, that run in the SEC, yeah, that 11-yard run would probably be an 18, 20-yard run. But against Texas, there's so, there's so much speed on the field. That Texas can, you know, shorten those runs or limit them. In and we've been talking about sort of that hybridization of defense and how you need to have that speed. And it's like this is a great example that if you have speed plus power, it really can be something because it can overpower, say, size. It isn't necessarily just always the biggest guys. And we've known that, you know, for like, say, 20 years, mm-hmm. you've seen it morph towards that. But then if you can get the right strength guy with the right top athletes and you can combine that speed, it's like, yeah, we're on, you're undersized, but if you're undersized, you still can get way more velocity and end up exerting more power upon your opponent that's bigger than you because you're combining those two factors and very very few teams have that top end size and speed. Something else we've always discussed on this show, and, and Jeff has talked about it a ton, and you've written about it a ton at uh, Horns 247. You know, f- uh, defense is now the definition of it has to change. It is changing. Situational defense is now mm-hmm. more important than ever. Um, and, that, and that includes situations like, hey, it's second and six. I'm going to go with this package. I'm going to go with this personnel grouping on the D line. That kind of thing. And, and Todd Orlando in that game, I thought that was probably the most underrated aspect of his game plan. How he used guys situationally, B.J. Foster. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were certain guys that stood out in certain situations. Aminahu, you mm-hmm. know, Malcolm Roach. You know, they may have been a little small. Th- even An- even Anthony those Wheeler. tweeners are great. Even Jimmy, Anthony all those Wheeler, tweeners. I think he used really, really well and different than he had used. I mean, Joseph Asai is a yeah. great example. He started that game, mm-hmm. but they he started him for a reason. So I think that was also underrated aspect of it. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start talking about the Texas offense and the job Sam Ellinger did. Uh, really, this is where you kind of start having a look, okay, what did Georgia have compared to what they have when they're full strength? I, I think the biggest miss, and this directly relates to Sam Ellinger's play, the biggest miss Georgia had was Jordan Davis. When you've got a 6'6", 320-pound nose tackle who yeah. really does a great job of collapsing the pocket, doesn't let quarterbacks climb and escape. I mean, we saw Sam Ellinger yeah, time and again, uh, you know, be able to, yeah, really. And, and, presence and, and Georgia awesome. was a different defense before they started playing him more and were a completely different defense yeah. once he was in the game. And once he left the Alabama game, we saw, you know, some things open up for, for Alabama in that SEC championship game. But, you know, I thought that was a big miss. But overall, Rod, when you start talking about game plans, I thought Tom Herman, Tim Beck, that offensive staff, did a really good job of making sure yep. Texas never lost a numbers advantage. And I even go back to the first play of the game where it was a little flare pass to Trey Watson, which I think they counted as a lateral. I think it they was. just gave him a, a rushing attempt for that. But they motioned Andrew Beck yeah, at the last true. minute to really use him. It's almost like a it was almost like a sweep, but it's like a, a swing. I call it a swing screen. That's like a, like, swing, yeah. a swing pass, but it was ended up being a screen. When it almost works the same there. way as like an old school sweep. It does. Like it really you're pulling, you're pulling like a sweep. You got, sweep. You, exactly you got right. your tight end lead blocking like yeah. a fullback. And literally, Trey Watson can throw off that to the back side. I think that's why they threw it backwards. Ooh. But it was, it was that kind of stuff though that I thought was Rod. You said it yesterday when we were talking about it on the Rodcast simplistically brilliant like they didn't reinvent the wheel it's just hey let's just make sure against this defense that we're kind of plus one in the numbers game depending on which side of the field we want to use which we're the one on the field side the boundary side yeah let's just make sure we got the numbers advantage you know it's great because okay so we know let's talk about what we know and like the 
the known the known like quantities when you're talking about this matchup, they know they couldn't just line up and just overpower Georgia at the mm-hmm. line of scrimmage, right? Yep. That's going to be really tough for Space. them to do. So what they did was they put them in a phone booth, right? You put them in a phone booth. That's why Beck being in and Watson being in with Sam and the O-line, that's eight in the box, essentially. A power and pack. for Georgia, they got to match up with that number. And I will give Texas mm-hmm. credit. Texas outnumbered them in the box probably 75% of the time. Seemed yeah. like it, yeah. And it was really So to get to the edges, what do you do? It's going to be hard for us to kind of run to the edges on Georgia. They're really fast. <laughs> so what they did was they just threw to the edges. It was. It was like the swing screen. And the, and the uh, I think Ingram had a couple of those, too, where he would throw in there. Kind of like the flare manufactured route. run Yeah, and they would pull a couple of linemen. And it's all it was, an extension of the running game mm-hmm. for them. And it was a high percentage passes, so it minimized risk mm-hmm. for Sam Ellinger. Got Sam in a groove, but also and also allowed Texas to get, get to the perimeter and stretch that G, that Georgia defense a little bit. So that's the way they were able to. Hey, we can and Bam Bam Sam will keep your power running game, all right, as a factor, and he did that. But when you want to get to the edges, that's how they decided to get to the edges. There weren't many runs where they just got to the edge. That's an Georgia. air raid principle right there. Yeah, you know it's what just I mean? the it's idea. Like, that well, that's what West Virginia did on exactly. Texas, right? They just up. Oh, so go let's mm-hmm. a little, little slip screen out here. I thought, Why work so hard to get it there when we can yeah, get it out there? And look at the yards after the catch. I think Texas had 177 yards total passing. 97, I counted, of the 177 came after the catch. That's just around 54% of their yards were yards after the catch. I know Lil Jordan Humphrey played a big role, too. But you talk about, and, and, you know, some of that's yards after contact. You talk about the physicality aspect. Mm-hmm. Texas really took that on the outside with the yards after the catch, uh, you know, getting to the perimeter and being able to use Andrew Beck as a blocker, a lead blocker a lot of the times. Basically, like you said, on the sweep. Yeah. Well, and the th- good thing to add on to what you're saying with the strategic mm-hmm. aspect of it, you put out your power, what – looks to be a power package to match up because you need the bodies yeah. to do that but it's like but our power package is faster and more athletic than your power, it's package. A big power package and it's yeah. that it's exactly what you want that you're still trying to get it on the edge and get it out to guys to get in them in space and beat one on ones it was brilliant and t- Georgia didn't adjust to that honestly to like the third quarter right. yeah it's like <laughs> yeah, they didn't like, know Ingram like, well, and Watson could point, both do it yeah. but you don't have one back that sort to of it to like the third quarter and that's, if you're Texas all you need it's like all we need is a way to move the chains stay ahead of the chain. They weren't big gains. No. They were seven yard chunk here, four yard chunk here, you know, eight yard chunk here. But it was like, hey, we're ahead of the chains. That's all we need. I yep. mean, yeah, you look just run down Trey Watts and Matt, to your point about getting to the corner, we kind of knew look, if you're gonna get to the edge on Georgia, it's gonna be your running back just got to go be an athlete and make a great play. And yeah. we saw Watson do that on the 20-yard run where he breaks the tackle yeah, right behind the line of scrimmage yeah. and then is able to bounce it out and he's got nothing but you know real estate in front of him and goes for 20 yards. But, guys, it's not overwhelming. This is Trey Watson's production. He had – you look at the final numbers – 18 for 91, but you start running down like the, the per, carry. per carry. Yeah. 7, 2, 2, 4, 3, 5, 20, minus 1, 8, minus 1. Like, it wasn't like overwhelming, yeah. but it was just, it was almost like death by paper cuts. And, and, and once Texas gets in the red zone, and I still, I truly believe it. I could be off. I think they got one of the top five, if not the best red zone weapon in the country. Yeah, I think he's the best at this point. Like, you know what I mean? Like Tebow. 16 <laughs> rushing touchdowns have all come in the red zone. You know he can hurt you as a passer in the red zone. Hell, he doesn't even use his 6'6 six, six wide receiver, 6'4 <laughs> wide receiver in the red zone. Only need he's, to. They're that effective. They just, just ran. And everybody knows it's coming. Everybody mm-hmm. knows what Texas is going to do. They're going to do that, that, that quarterback Bad power. Numbers. It's coming. And even Georgia. When Georgia bowled their back, right, when they get the first and goal on mm. the one-yard line and they go first, second, third, and fourth with the same principle, basically the same play as this, the quarterback power, I th- to me that just showed you Tom Herman's stubbornness. Like, no, Strategic. no, no. Strategic. He's going to get it. Th- he's going to get it. Yeah. Gonna, the odds are on our side. Yeah. This guy, Bam That's Bam a numbers Sam, guy right there knowing. He's such a unique weapon. Mm-hmm. At you know at six three two thirty, but also being a, a quarterback who can be a part of the power running game. That month off basically won the game for Texas in the power running game because I think if that game is you know when the Big Twelve championship was, he's not fully healthy. Physically. You know what I mean? So he 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 can't be that element in the power running game when he was healthy and he looked healthy versus Georgia. Hell, man, he, he's he's a Sam we know trying to run over linebackers. And that's what and you safety. do in postseason football. Yeah. You see it in and the he, NFL yeah. right now. All and the even Georgia running. and even Georgia was like. Holy hell, man, this dude's hard to tackle. It's different on film watching that dude, man. He's built like a Kardashian. 
He's got bottom. He's built like a centaur. All that weight. I, I would like to see what his weight distribution is. Oh, yeah. It's 230 pounds. I bet 100, 150 of it is all down low. Like, it's all yep. butt and beyond. And that's kind of his superpower. It's his big butt. People think yep. it's weird, but it's like, no, no, no. At the combine, there's a reason. And these scouts, when they see a Sturdy dude base, with man. a really high booty and a big booty, they go, Oh, he's got a nice big butt. I love it. You know what I mean? Because it's a sturdy base. Oh. Right? It's hard to bring down. It's hard to bring down people and to get them unbalanced when you got a nice big base. If you got a big booty. Now, that's mm-hmm. not why everybody likes big butts. And I like big butts and I cannot lie. But for Sam, think about how many times Georgia had him on a blitz. And they they usually in the in the SEC they can just kind of arm tackle a guy and bring him down. Sam was like, whoop, he ducked mm-hmm. down and they go, damn. Like you see that guy goes too. down. He's got a great base man for for a quarterback to be able to run. Yep. And it is Tebow like. Once it's in the red zone, he becomes very Tebow esque. Yeah, but he's better throwing. <laughs> he's like a better that. throwing than Tebow. <laughs> I don't know if he's as good a runner as Tebow. People not yet. say that. I, that's not he's not honestly Tebow's a much better runner than Sam. That's Tebow's a varying Tebow degrees. Tebow never had to run into people because Tebow could avoid you. Tebow yeah. had a little right. Tebow had a little evade. You know what I mean? He could he could evade you a little bit. Sam He's not trying to he's avoid still, you. He's not elusive. Like he's coming right at you. He's easy to tackle in terms of being able to get be physical with him and engage him. But once that physicality comes, once that hit comes, he delivers the blow. Yeah, and yeah, think about the foot <laughs> speed. I mean, just remember how much Colt uh, McCoy's foot speed developed over his time at Texas. Sure, I mean, off Sam Ellinger as a yeah. sophomore, his foot speed in a couple of years may be just something that could get him to be a little bit more evasive and be that type of guy. But you talking about that sturdy base? You see it sure. with his throws and playing on a plane above the opponents, and it's yeah. just something that he's that prototype of a modern power spread. That's exactly what you want in the quarterback, and he seems to be aligned. Like his mentality, it fits it perfect. It's exactly what you want. Swagger now. I mean, when you look at just the offense from the top to the bottom, you know, preseason, right? I remember you talking about what we wanted to see from the backs and the end up finishing the year. These are with the adjusted yardage, so it takes out some sack stuff from passing and disperses from rushing. But you end up with Watson with 786, Ingram 708, and Sam with 677. That's over 2,000 yards right there between those two. And then you have 2,000-yard receivers. Basically, Colin Johnson just came up short, but it's like – like 15, Literally, 15, the, was a 15 yard short. 988 on Damn. uh, it'd be from 12, the FB. I didn't even think about that. I, yeah, uh, they, but they targeted him. I, I, they were doubling him early on, and it wasn't like an obvious double. They just kept a safety over the top of Colin Johnson for some reason. It was harder for them to do against Lil Jordan Humphrey. Go look at the first two or three targets to Colin, their incompletions, but mm-hmm. you can see that safety lurking yeah, right Colin, over the If top. you look at targets in this game, uh, LJ eight, seven catches on eight targets. Uh, Colin three catches on six targets. Yeah, exactly. And I think so. They count the two point conversion to Colin as a tar- as a target. No, that that counts. It's not counts as a target. Okay. Separate, See, yeah. but that's kind of goes what I've said about Colin. So that one was the big thirty something yard reception, and then I think the other one was like wide receiver screens mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. So one of them was a big first. That's kind of how it is with Colin. He like, had three. He had three for forty, and thirty five of those was on the deep ball down the sideline. That's. And then once you get the two point conversion with him too, I mean that's kind of pretty much what Colin Johnson is. Like you basically target him eight times, you're gonna get three or four plays that wonder, really matter or first downs or big plays. And it's, I mean, but Colin, but but Lil Jordan Humphrey's different. Lil Jordan Humphrey. That's why NFL scouts love Lil Jordan, yeah. Lil Jordan Humphrey. And he ain't, he ain't made his announcement yet because I think he's probably gonna leave. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if he comes back, oh God, in heaven. Like yeah. Texas is gonna he be a top best three. Best three. Roommate, the best yeah. Yeah. roommate. Texas year. will be a top five team if he decides probably to return. The best offense in the conference. But he has year. seven catches, all of them for first downs. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that, that's that, impressive. Yeah. That that's your, impressive. I mean, and that <laughs> sort of shows that chemistry you wanted to exactly. see post Colt McCoy and Shipley. You hear yeah. about the roommates and all that stuff, yeah. and like the the idea that over time that you can grow together and those yeah. type of players. It's it's hard to have, but if you can be in college and form that type of chemistry, it's really rare because you have these tiny time windows. But Rod, right. I think the, I think this this game sums up kind of what the offense was this year. It was based on the flow of the game. What do we need to do offensively to win? Mm-hmm. True that. And we saw Tom Herman That's time and again just mold it and shape it. All right, you need to score forty some against West Virginia. Let's, Let's go score it. forty. You need us to, you know, burn some clock against TCU and USC. We'll go burn some clock. Yeah, and, it's and an make, honest appraisal. Make sure we've got long You're possessions. Right. I agree. And and the thing that we talk about playmakers. Like this staff, I don't think it's enough credit for identifying playmakers. We had shows last year where we'd look at, and no disrespect to the guys I'm going to mention, but we're like, you know, why does Dorian Leonard have nine targets in this game? Why does Lorenzo Joe have six targets? Yeah. You look at the targets in this game, Lil Jordan Humphrey with eight, Colin Johnson with six, Dude, Devin yeah. Duvernay with five, yeah. and then you've got Keontae Ingram with three, Trey Watson with two, mm-hmm. Andrew Beck with two, and then one each for Gerard Hurd and nope. Sam Ellinger. Yeah, I, no wasted targets in my right. opinion. 
I agree. You're getting the ball to guys that need it. Sam Best. with the one the one trick play, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, you're getting the ball in the hands of the guys that need it. Totally agree. Get the ball to your get the ball to your playmakers. I get that to me. Force feeding the ball to your mm-hmm. playmakers, I should say. That's just your probably your number one priority as an offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. But what I love that you talk about this simplistic brilliance of the game plan. One other thing they did on offense that was just simple, but we and, and Matt, you 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 can probably expound on this and expand on it better than I can. Um, but the, uh, the the trend of throwing more on first down, yeah, and starting off the drive with with, with trying to get a success, a high success rate. Mm. Um, I tracked it in their first twenty three first down plays. Texas threw the ball twelve of their first twenty three first down plays on the eleven drives. Take out the kneel down, they threw the ball on the first play of the drive. Eight out of the eleven drives. Yeah. And they, like you said, they're not throwing it downfield to Colin Johnson, Lil Jordan Humphrey. They were just like, no, 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 dink and dunk here. Hey, uh, Devin Duvernay, I see you over there. Little hitch route, little, little uh, you know, a little corner route, whatever it is. But they were high percentage passes. But what I think it did for Texas, it kept them ahead of the change. A lot of them were just an extension of the running game, but it kept Georgia off balance. And, and I've got a great stat right? for you, Rod, with that. So you mm-hmm. go and you start looking at the third down numbers. Texas is nine of nineteen in this game on third downs. On third and third and shorts, which is you know third and, and one or four okay. somewhere in that area, Texas was four for seven converting those. Wow, there you go. Yeah, there so you that's go. and then overall, you if you look at the season, Texas was the team. And I remember we were talking about this back, I think, before the Oklahoma game, but how Texas on standard downs run rate was lower of almost a full standard deviation lower than the national average, meaning that you're passing in those, and then yeah. on the passing down run rate was a full standard deviation above that. So you're actually going and ending up on passing downs, running the ball. So you're doing what the opposite of what the defense is dictating, which exactly. is exactly what you're bringing up right now with talking about passing because before, back in the day, the idea of staying on schedule, but then mm-hmm. your predictability, then sort of you don't realize scripts all three downs if you run that's on true. first because Good then point. it puts you into a situation that's either second and long or if you're successful, it's second and short. Well, second and long, you're going to pass. Second and short, you're going to run. Run, and that's where you can get into these. You, you hear it's called like a, this. The play caller was in a groove, and he was sort of finding it out. And it's sort of the guy that is always one play ahead of <clears throat> that. So then you're unpredictable on offense, and you aren't letting basically the down dictate you, which is when the defense can then dictate and become the offense. Sort of the way you saw toward, Todd Orlando doing that on the defensive end for Texas. Yeah. And to, to your point, Matt, when you look at Texas play selection on third down. Nine pass attempts, nine rushing attempts. Yep. Yeah. No, and they then, did. They stayed ahead had, of the chains. You had, you had, and, and your average, your average distance to go on third down was third and six. Yep. And Which while, is could a Sam Sam Ellinger scramble away? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's what or you, one what of those you, slants or mm. something. Yeah. Yep. Exactly and right. For the whole season, what what did I'm going to see what Texas finished down their average third down because we always had that here third and distance finished 28th. It was average to third and 6.9, so just under seven yards for the season. So yeah, it was, right on with their average. The offensive game plan was it's the best way to put it. It was unpredictable without being risky, and mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Like yeah. they they didn't take a lot of risks, but it was unpredictable. Like if you're watching a team. It, the, the film, they did some things that were different than the film. Throwing on first down a lot, uh, the, the flare, the swing screens. They did some things that were a little bit different, but they still kept it simple. Like, they still kept it within the context mm-hmm. of what they do well. Yeah. This, yeah. Is where, this is where we hang our hat. And I, I was just like, man, you know what? I expect them to have to do more to beat Georgia, but, yeah. but Tom, that goes back to what Tom Herman's always says. Like, no, 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 no. When we play we our best football, when we're doing what we do really well – we're good. We're That's good when you want to Texas anybody. to get there. Texas yeah. can get to that point. That's I big. thought one of the, the second best drive of the game for Texas ended up being that drive in the second half. Remember, they didn't get points out of it. It was a missed field goal. It took up like five minutes and 30-something seconds. So it was like an 11-play drive. Mm-hmm. But it was Texas. Ten that, plays, 37 yards, eight up, 533 on the clock. It was one of, it was one of those, those six-minute drives by Texas where they just <laughs> ran. They only threw it. I, I think they ran it every play. They actually flipped the script in from what they had been doing the entire game. They, they actually ran it every play, I believe. Let me know if I'm mistaken here, except the third downs. They threw it to LJ every third down. It was like, <laughs> it was like run, run, third down, throw to LJ. Run, run, 
Third down, throw to LJ. And that run, means the run, defense can down, be doing Throw to LJ. So they were basically like, because they were trying to milk the clock at that point. Mm-hmm. They had already like, okay, we're up. Our game plan worked. Our adjustment now is let's go back to what we do really well, which is control the ball, control the clock, milk it, and just wear down this team. And they, they that drive wore Georgia down. They didn't get points out of it. But you go back, it took up so much time that Georgia didn't have enough time to come back. That was a really important drive. Wish they could have got points, probably could have sealed the game. But that's what Texas was at their best. And that's game. where the, the coaches sort of can see something. It's almost like the ripping your heart out moment because you can be doing stuff right on defense and you still can't stop them. Can't They're stop just building. milking the clock. And then, okay, you got us to a passing down. Well, our most reliable combination still is can't a battery pitcher catcher beat you in there. there. But yeah. it's it, it, they only threw it right, like you said, on that 10-point <laughs> drive three times. There was all on third down. Oh, LJ. Third and four, six-yard completion of Humphrey. Third and six, 16-yard completion of Humphrey. <laughs> third and eight, three-yard completion of Colin Johnson. Oh, yep. okay. No, sorry, I got the that was the Colin one. Well, but yeah, then so my bad. Yeah, but still. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it was just, yeah. but it was just like, no, no, no. We know what we got to do. And every time Georgia was like, all right, third down, man, we got to bore our back. Texas was like, no, we, we, got, we got third and manageable. With third and four, with third and five, with third and six, we got this. Well, and that's if you know what you're going to do, then you go out there, you end up not turning it over, and something that Texas done all year. And then field position. This stood out to me when I looked at the advanced box score of the game. I couldn't believe how dominant, because, I mean, it's the biggest worry after last year, losing Dixon, one of the best runners. Texas's average field position was a 38.2. Georgia was a 23.9. It was almost a 15-yard difference between the two. So, again, Texas didn't turn it over. Sam, it's like he literally – is at the point where this is just automated offense. Worst case scenario, you're going to pin them back. Early on in the game, right, field position is mm-hmm. how Texas gets points on the yep. board. That punter at the kneel down, what, mm-hmm. the 27 or whatever. Then the punter had a shanked punt, I believe, yep. and gave Texas favorable field position, and Texas was able to take advantage of That's it. That's so the idea right. of wins yeah. above replacements so big that Texas, you had to replace somebody with Dixon, but you're placing with a guy that didn't screw up. It's so It's serviceable, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's but then serviceable. if, say, yeah. you make a mistake, that's so much worse than your average totally play, good. and that's one of those few mistakes yeah. that can be a glaring hole that can end up being the difference in a game. Totally agree. But Bushevsky in this game, I thought was awesome. Five punts, uh, average of forty one point four, long of fifty two, which to me was one of the biggest plays in the game that yeah, nobody's going to talk about. Uh, getting it out of the end zone and getting you at mm-hmm. halftime, uh, that was the only punt of his that didn't end up inside the twenty. Damn, Buchevsky. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Big yeah. boy Buchevsky. He had four, five, four, of his, four of his <laughs> five, his, four of his five <laughs> inside the 20, Buchevsky. and the only one that didn't land in there was the one he had that got you to halftime. Well done. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I, yeah, actually, I did not know that. I got to give Buchevsky some credit. That's legit. But, guys, we talk about it. When yeah. we break it down, Texas won the game in all three phases. Yeah. But, but I mean. Man, what game has have they won all three phases this year? I think. <sighs> Man. Maybe Iowa State? Yeah, man, Iowa State. Maybe, yeah, like, Iowa State or T- 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 TCU and USC. was like that. USC, USC was kind of kit. like that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Those, were it's been a while, and it's hard to do that. Yeah, because well, that was our big thing, right, is that one phase would be off of one quarter, uh, uh-huh, one phase right. would have a bad quarter or something like that. We wanted yep. a complete Oklahoma, game. Baylor this injury, is pretty yep. close to having a complete game in all three phases mm-hmm. as they've been all year long. Yep. You know what I mean? And then props to Colin Johnson. We talked about the three catches, the two-point conversion, recovering the onside kick and making sure that – Oh yeah, the pucker factor that. doesn't kick in at the end when you're like, oh man, if they score here and, and you know what, overtime. That, because didn't they did they kick it twice? I remember, like, or did they only kick it once? Ah, uh, go back and look because I was on the field for okay. that. Uh, well, no, I'm just, I just got to make sure. It might have been a penalty. There was one in the NFL I'll, game this week. I'm okay, sure. maybe I'm I, yeah, maybe my time. Either way, we get Colin come yeah. through. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think they had they actually had a chance at that um, that that at onside kick. I want to go back and look at it, but. Uh, so it's they just, didn't it's just showing well. it's just showing the one. Okay, man. yeah, no worse. Um, yeah, yeah, but it, it it no, it was Colin Johnson. I want to say that six targets, three catches. So one went for two went for first down, and one was just a reception. Yeah, and then he had the two point conversion. I mean, yeah, that's Colin. That's I thought productive. I thought they should have targeted him more, but that it lines up with the stats that basically fifty three percent of the time you target him, you get a first down or a touchdown. <laughs> but you talk about simplistic brilliance, right? We talk about it. What's the if you're running a two point play? What are they going to least expect? You haven't put the fade on film all year. 
You have it. Yeah, there's no reason people don't think about it. You got to be thinking about the power and putting eight guys in the box to stop Sam. And then where Sam plays the ball, there's, as a DB, Rod, there's nothing you can yeah, do. Yeah, nothing about that. Yeah. Nope. I'm surprised we don't. They don't do it more. But like you, they don't need it in the red no. zone. That's how good Sam it's is. Always good, but see, that's so great to have that to fall back. Oh, on. it is. Just the same way you have his legs to fall back on, and it's just so perfect that Texas is at that point that yeah. you had the defense can beat you on everything, and you have a couple of things that's almost indefensible on top of it. Like I said, as we start to close this out. And we'll look, trust me, we're going to spend the whole offseason talking yeah, about yeah, this, this game is just and, the, yeah, beginning you know, what this does the for the program. Down. But, Rod, like I said, told you this on the Rodcast, I've talked about it on the site. And this win was about culture as much as anything because when you look at the personnel matchups, Georgia's got better personnel than Texas. I think so. In, in multiple areas. So. You know, that doesn't, that, the, the outcome of the game doesn't change that. What I think this does is it goes to, for everybody in that Texas locker room, if you didn't believe what Tom Herman's telling you, you should mm-hmm. believe it now. When you play your best on any given Saturday mm-hmm. and play a complete game, you can run with anybody, anybody in the country. Yeah. Well, and then Texas can. fans <laughs> can sit back and be like, man, when Tom Herman and these Texas teams take on any good team, we play some good football. We just need to make sure they don't have one of those Maryland's. Well, Maryland's not on the schedule anymore. There you so go. You're good, but, you're good but literally, I mean, go back to Houston and right. all the dominations against the Florida State or against Oklahoma. You know, it's a big game football. It's good to know that right now, the Texas coach that you've seen the last two years, you've been right there in big games against the best teams. And no. that's, that's a great baseline. To no, have. no, it is. And he really is good in big games, but he's also good as the underdog. So my, I think the so next challenge good. for this team is going to be you're not an underdog. Nope. I know it's great to be able to sell that, but that's an easy sell. I can sell being an underdog because mm-hmm. you know that's the American dream, right? Everybody's an underdog trying to come up. That's every, easy to sell that narrative. His his narrative now as a coach because he's been an underdog his entire life too is now you're the big dog. All right, you're not David. You're Goliath. All right, nobody's going to be rooting for you other than the people in your fandom. Everybody hates Texas. They're throwing the horns down even when Texas isn't playing. All right, yeah. they don't like Texas. You're a villain. All right, you're what Notre Dame is, you're what the Yankees are, you're what the Cowboys are. You got to win with that attitude. The underdog thing is only going to be if you turn the program around like we all seeing that you are about to. When that happens, you'll never be an underdog again. Right. You know what I mean? Like, sorry, in 05, I, was Texas an underdog how many times? Once? Once. <laughs> in the U.S. Again? There you go. You'll be an underdog once, once, and then you can you can preach the underdog thing and go win the big one and shock the world. But I'm going to tell you, if when Texas is back, which Sam Ellinger says, we're back. So, so, we're, so we're really doing this finally? Yeah, so we're back. We're doing so this? If okay. Texas is back, you're not an underdog. No. So you got to go win with that swag. You got to go win with the target on you when everybody's giving you their best shot and you still got to go win. And that's that's the next step for them. Yeah, I just you know we talked Rod, and this kind of started you know during your time on the Forty Acres, and it was a constant theme you heard throughout the Mac Brown era. Uh, you know, is Texas a soft program? Are they soft? Can they mm. can they play physical yeah. football? Yeah. with anybody. You realize at this point, Texas is a program. Do you know how you know you're a physical program when nobody talks about the need to be physical? Yeah, it's just a, it's a good point. You just are. Yeah, it's just a baseline. It's, you know? it's part of your identity. Yeah. And yeah. that's ingrained in the DNA of this program now. Is it's a Tom Herman thing too? I think they, yeah. U of H was physical, but it's one of those deals though. Now you know I, mean? I think for the players, Power. you know, I go yeah. back to I go back to uh, you know watching that first U documentary that ESPN did, and Art Kehoe talking about you know Jimmy Johnson's practices and practices being harder than the games, and Art Kehoe saying the old offensive line coach at Miami saying, guys realize hell if it's this hard, you know. Monday through Friday, man, the payoff on Saturday has got to be good, right? Yeah. And I think that's what guys are realizing. Now, there's a reason you have toughness Tuesday and all this other stuff. Man, the payoff on Saturday has got to be there, and now I think they're starting to see, oh, yeah, the payoff is there when we line up and, and we have the right mindset to go be physical yeah. and knock heads with people. Yeah, if you can do it against Georgia, you can pretty much do it against anybody in the country. Yeah, no question about it. And to add to that, a caveat to the Sam Ellinger, we're back conversation. Um, which everybody's a little, you know, cautious about. All right, but hey, man, if he feels that kind of swagger, that's like oh, oh, four, you know, Rose Bowl Vince Young when he says, "Oh yeah, I will be back." Yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, like, he was impersonated. He, yeah, he's willing to put it all on his shoulders and say, "No, no, no, this is my team. It's my offense. I'll make sure we be we're, we're going to be back." Yeah. All right, in the off season, I'll be the one leading the drills. We'll be back, which is great. And Texas is back. But when and going to your point about Miami, when Texas, when the when the practices are harder than the games, and when I face Roy Williams every day in practice, mm-hmm. and that's better than any wide receiver that I'll ever face yep. in the Big 12, 
that's when Texas truly that's will be back. That's when the game's when, easy. Right, when Michael Huff is going up against, uh, you know, Roy, Roy Williams, when it's two top five draft picks going up against one another, that's when Texas will be back. You know what I mean? Like, that's because then truly – only Oklahoma is the game where we will face talent that's like ours or better. You right. know what I mean? Or in that bowl game. Because that's truly, you're right, that, to me, that was the key to Jimmy Johnson. Or in Ohio State now, or Bama now, or Clemson. Hell, Trevor Lawrence, true freshman. Yeah, you want to know why he's not shocked by Alabama? Because look at the D-line that he's got to play up against every day in practice. Mm-hmm. That D-line's pretty damn good. He ain't shocked by what he sees at Bama. He's like, well, I see that every day. And that's what I think. Tom Herman's going to get back to, and that goes back to what your thing about recruiting classes. And, and one other thing before we wrap it up, and I know we're getting close, Tom Herman said something. My favorite thing Tom Herman said after the game, um, he said the culture of the locker room, goes back to you talking about a culture win, Jeff, became a player-led team instead of a coach-led team. And I've talked about this on the Blitz. Mm-hmm. Mac Brown is great. He's a Hall of Famer. And of course, give him props. And, it, and ironically, Vince Young is being inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame, and congrats to him. But all the best Texas football teams all throughout history and the late, great D.K. era, I bet he would back me up on this. They're on cruise control, baby. The coach just gets out of the way. Once you got great leadership in place, once you got, you know, uh, great work ethic and the culture in place like Tom Herman's doing, I'm going to let Sam run this show. This is Sam's team. And that was V.Y.'s team. And on our best teams, they were player led teams. It was, I, I didn't need a coach to come call me out and keep me accountable because you know who did it? Casey Hampton, Sean Rogers, uh, Corey Redding, uh, Derek Johnson. I had Quentin Jammer. I had guys that would call me out if I wasn't doing what I needed to do or I wasn't making the plays I needed to make or playing up to a certain standard. And the coaches, they need to say a damn thing to me. And Mac Brown never said a damn thing to me about that because there was always some player that was right before him saying, we need to pick this up right now, right damn now. This ain't Texas football. That's when we'll be back. And I think we're getting there because Tom Herman's saying some of the same things. I remember Mac Brown saying. Mac Brown loved when, when V.Y. came into that locker room and said, this is my locker room. He'd been waiting on that. The confidence. The he guy put that. it on his shoulders. Yeah, and when so Colt it's not came on in, Mac, dude. Colt, yeah. Well, you, you, the, well, the, 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 the best teams that. are never going to be Mac-led no, teams. No. Not, that's not Mac. He's not Nick you Saban, uh, for God's sakes. He's Mac Brown. He brings in a great alpha male yeah. to run that team, and that's what he does. With Chris Sims or Major Applewhite or uh, Vince Young or Cole McCourt today. That. Those are the best Mac Brown led teams. I think Tom Herman has a little Mac Brown in him, and I think the Tom Herman's best teams are going to be the player led teams. And that's as we wrap up. That to me is the connection between Tom Herman and Sam Ellinger. Because if you're around Sam for a little bit, you're around him in a press conference setting. Like he's st- starting to sound like Tom Herman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he's almost like yeah, he is. quarterback is a direct extension yeah, is. of the head coach. Yeah, he is. And we've seen it. We saw it with. Mac and Vince with Mac and Colt mm-hmm. with Coach Royal and James Street. Just like go Ivan. on, just go on down the list, man. When mm-hmm. there's that, when there's that bond Synergy. between head coach and quarterback, to where, I mean, Rod, you talk about Mac not, you know, has best teams being player on. What else do you need to say than your quarterback going in writing a note on the board for everybody saying, if you want to beat Ohio State, meet me on the practice field at eight o'clock. Your job is done. Yeah. Your coach, oh, my job is done. I got, yeah. yep. I got that guy's got it. He's yeah. got it. You know what I mean? And like, I think, I think that's yeah. what you're seeing from Sam Ellinger because I think the way he plays, and you talk to guys about this, um, guys on that team, they'll tell you the way he plays. When you see a guy at that position sacrificing his body, it makes you want to be a better player. Dabo goes from Deshaun Watson to Trevor Lawrence. That's a, that, you know what I mean? Like, I got, I got the alpha male in place. I'm good. I'll just let this thing go on cruise control. So yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I, I love that now they're starting to sound like whatever. Remember in the Texas Bowl, I, I saw them dancing, Tom Herman doing his mm-hmm. little dance or whatever, and I said, who's the quarterback dancing with him? Yep. It ain't Shane. Hmm. It ain't Shane. The quarterback started the <laughs> you know I mean? dance like, and the Tom it, wanted it, it, to it join in. Shane. And, I, and I know it was a small thing, but I was like, that's a bond, dude. They they think alike. They're mm-hmm. like-minded. They're, 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 they're twin souls. And for the record, for the second straight year in a bowl game, Drew Locke did not secure the bag. <laughs> his, uh, the SEC did not there. secure the damn bag. No. And like I said, you know, you can talk about all you want. No, Georgia, no. Georgia, Georgia was motivated to play. They just showed up and got their ass kicked, and so did, so did Alabama against Clemson. Just take it like a man, take your beating, and move on to the next one. Texas moving on to the next one. Sugar Bowl champs, a 10-win season, number nine in the final AP poll. Still waiting to see that coach's poll come out as of press time. But uh, it's going to be a fun offseason ahead of us, gentlemen. Uh, and we'll pick it up again next week. Matt, thanks for everything, man. You're more than welcome. 
Rod B, appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother, anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody True. at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn, 1049, 1019, AM 1260, streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com, where you can hear this show each and every week. And thanks to Matt, you can get us anywhere you get your podcast apps and always get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horn's 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.